I start up again and I'll, uh, uh, I'll try to finish uh, the third set of notes uh, where I want to show, uh, try to bring the two first lectures together and end today with some things where you can think about and, and try to really show you, you know, the difficulties in, in studying the combustion of energetic materials uh, it, from an experimental point of view and eventually from a theoretical point of view. <clears throat> so empirically, as I showed you in, in the, the last lecture, uh, one of the most important metrics for looking at an energetic material is its burning rate. Uh, empirically, the St. Robert's law or VA's law is used. Uh, you know, if I gather data and I want to correlate that data with an expression, I always ask the question, well, how does it correlate with the burning rate equal to some pre-exponential factor, burning rate coefficient times the pressure to some exponent. And everything I've been talking about so far, particularly in using this equation, assumes I have no cross flow across the surface. So I have a flat surface and, and the, the flame is regressing downward and, and the heat transfer from the, the gas to the solid <clears throat> is mainly through conduction. Okay, in, in many practical cases, I'm gonna actually have a cross flow across the surface. And that can change the, the characteristics of the burning quite significantly, uh, change the heat transfer process from the, obviously the gas phase to the surface. I now no longer just have conduction, but convection's been introduced, and I can have what's referred to as a, a rosa burning being introduced in the system. <clears throat> uh, just as an example, you know, if I'm talking about rocket motors, grain configurations are made in different types of shapes. Uh, and and I, I show two examples here, uh, uh, imagine that I have this rocket motor, this is the casing, and the entire casing is filled with the propellant. When I ignite it, I'm gonna ignite it at this end on the right-hand side. This is gonna be referred to as end burning. And so ideally, what I would hope is that this surface would regress to the left at the same rate. But near the edges, because of the boundary layers that start to grow, I can start seeing a, <clears throat> a non-linear shape across the surface and, and get the edges to burn faster than at the center. If I have a, 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 a grain in which it's not solid, but I actually have a hole down the center, a perforation, in that case, I'm going to want the, the burn to actually occur radially outward. Okay, so I'm going to try to ignite this entire inner surface at the same time, and it's going to propagate from the inside outward. So I'll have something like end on looking like this. Okay, you know, in, in the shape of this perforation in the center <coughs> could take different shapes. In this particular case here, I'm showing a, a star pattern, but it could be circular, could have different shapes. The reason for the star pattern is that people try to keep the amount of surface area the same as the, as the surface is regressing. So you can imagine if I ignited this on this surface here, as this starts regressing towards the outer wall here, I'm gonna be burning in these star regions as well. This increases the surface area initially, but as I burn further and further, that star region is going to start losing it, but I'm getting to a larger radius, and it's going to look more circular, and so the, the surface area as a function of time will not change. And under those conditions, then the pressure in the motor will stay nearly constant. <coughs> okay, but in this case here, you know, if the flow is going down the center of perforation, the, I'm going to have a convective flow over the surface, and it's going to yield some convective burning as well. <clears throat> now, when I go back and look at St. Robert's Law, <clears throat> the, I, I, just another thing I want to make you aware of, and if you looked at that analytical result and looked at what was in the brackets, we saw some temperature dependence, and that would have represented the A factor. Well, indeed, A is not really a constant. It's a function of the initial temperature of the propellant, and also a, of the, the, that's a function of the pressure, then how it's going to respond in the burning rate. So, a here is really a function of temperature, <clears throat> and people have introduced what's referred to then as the temperature sensitivity of the burning rate through this factor of A, and introduced the temperature sensitivity as sigma P, which is defined then as how the, the burning rate responds to the initial temperature at a constant pressure divided by the burning rate, so written in this form here. So if I go back and look at this uh, burning rate coefficient, it really has a temperature dependence in it, so I have a reference a factor times the exponential of the temperature sens sensitivity times the bracket of the initial temperature minus this reference temperature, what A is correlated to. And, and so I can end up writing down the burning rate in this modified form here. And temperature sensitivity, again, is a, a, a second metric that's very important then, because if, if I find that the, 
the propellant burning rate is sensitive to the initial temperature. Because this is in the exponential here, I don't have to change that temperature very much, and it's going to have a dramatic effect on the, the, on the burning rate itself. So you can imagine if, you know, if I'm storing this propellant out in Arizona, and it's at a certain temperature, and I have it up in Alaska during the winter, and it's at a different temperature, how much difference is the behavior going to occur in terms of affecting the burning rate? Okay, so just some examples of how this uh, temperature sensitivity changes with pressure. The show also it's a function of pressure. This is uh, ammonia dinitrogen, and what you find is most nitrate means most propellants have temperature sensitivities that are largest at lower pressures. Then as I go to higher pressures, they start to fall off. Ammonia perchlorate is sort of an anomaly. It initially decreases and it starts increasing as you go to higher pressures. But most, you know, the desirable one would be one that has nearly constant across the pressure range and obviously the lower the better because it's going to make you know the differences depending on location and, and temperature cycling uh, basically consistently between uh, burning rates. Okay so how does one empirically uh, measure the burning rate? I'll, I'll give you a, a few examples here. <clears throat> I showed you already uh, this probe technique where I have this strand and across the strand I put these wires that are hooked up to an electrical system as the propellant burns down, it breaks the wire, it opens a circuit, so I know when the, the burning rate passed that location. When it comes to an, another break wire, then I measure the, basically the time between those two break wires. I know the distance. I can burn, get a burning rate. Um, another common technique is an optical technique. So here, instead of a closed pressure vessel, I now need to have a windowed pressure vessel, so I have to be able to visually see the combustion process. I usually use a, some sort of high-speed camera to basically measure and visually see the, the propagation rate and I have some sort of scale then and I use that film then to back out how fast the, the burning rate is occurring. People have modified that where they, they use a, a laser servo system to keep that surface constant in time so I'm, I'm, I, it's an empirical process where I try to make the servo go up to keep this, the surface at a single point instead of regressing down. That's very valuable if I want to try to do a, a experimental analysis optical diagnostics on the gas phase above the surface, measure species concentrations and things like that. A third technique is to measure the pressure release. So here I'm going to, my pressure volume is going to be relatively small. And so now when the, when the propellant starts burning, I generate this gas, I have a constant volume system, and the pressure is going to increase with time as I burn the system. And so what I need here is I have to develop a model to analyze this system because the burning rate is going to change at each pressure. So I have to develop a model and empirically fit that model back to the experimental data. And that's going to require the knowledge of the final products because I've got to assume that I've got to know how much gas was being formed at each pressure. So I'm assuming everything goes to equilibrium and it forms these species. So there's a little bit of uncertainty in that analysis. Using uh, just the, putting it on a transducer, measuring the, the weight loss or the thrust that's produced as a function of time is another technique. This is more often used if I'm looking at transient burning, if, 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 to look at instantaneous burning processes. Microwave reflection interferometry, ultrasonics, where I send basically, you know, I, I attach the, the strand to a transducer. I send a, a basically a mechanical wave up to the surface and I measure the time for the mechanical wave to reflect off the surface and come back to the transducer. And x-ray techniques, like I showed you in that example early on. And again, most of these techniques that I showed you later are more difficult and are used typically for transient burning characteristics. So he here's an example of a, a simple strand burner. Uh, I would have the, the pressure vessel here. I'm showing this for a windowed strand burner. <clears throat> so there might be a window on this side. There could be another window on this side. I could back backlight the strand or just look at it without it backlit to see the, the flame above the surface as well instead of washing it out. I'm going to have some sort of camera then monitoring the, the process as the surface regresses downward. I'm going to uh, pressurize the system with somewhat of an inert gas so there's no oxygen there, so argon or, or nitrogen. Uh, and depending on the volume here, uh, most often I'd want to conduct this at a constant pressure. So if the volume's small enough or the burning rate's very fast, what I may want to do is al allow a little bit of flow to go through the system to maintain a constant pressure. Uh, to the top of the, the strand here, I could have basically a nichrome wire to create a heat source to ignite it. And I'm going to want to assume then that the, the flame distributes across the surface and regresses in a 1D fashion downward. 
So here's an example of a strand sitting on a, a mount in a burner. So this is the, the strand itself. As I mentioned before, typically, typical size, you know, and th this is empirical, but most often about six millimeters in diameter. Uh, length scale about 50 millimeters so that one can go through the initial transient ignition process and measure a steady state burning process. I, I show in, in this diagram here uh, that ignition is occurring with a, essentially a nichrome wire at the top. What can happen in, in, in some systems, I can actually have a flame spread down the side that's faster than the regression rate of the solid coming down. So I want to sometimes inhibit that process. So often what one does is put an inhibitor around the outside of the, the strand. That could be a, just a, a, a hydrocarbon, for example, paint or nail polish that's put on a very thin coating, which is a fuel, which basically is not going to react at all, obviously, with the inner environment and, and, and will burn and not affect the, the burning process that much. So in this particular example, too, uh, th there's some brake wires. The wires go through the system. I know the distance between the brake wires. I measure the timing to go between there. I've got an idea of the, and, and several brake wires to get a few point measurements to see if it's steady state or not. One of the advantages of using a visual observation is I can get many more points, almost instantaneous measurements of the burning rate through the system. There is also a thermocouple inserted in the system here, as I showed you before, with a, th a flat thermocouple. When the wave passes that, you can get a measurement of the, of the temperature profile. So here, here's an example of that system, you know, it's set up in a reinforced test cell, uh, the, the pressure vessel here, optical windows. This system here goes to about 7,000 PSI. Uh, and here's an, an XT example. After the ignition process, you can see that the, the burning is a, is a steady burning process. These are examples of the flame structure above RDX, uh, JA2, which is double base propellant, and uh, M43 propellant is another RDX base propellant. As I said, th this vessel goes to about seven to 10,000 PSI. We've now, out at the labs, just built a, a new optical pressure uh, chamber. Uh, this chamber now will go up to about 300 megapascals. So that's about 3,000 atmospheres, okay? And it's, it's optical, it's got optical windows in it. Uh, the internal volume is quite large. Uh, the diameter is like five inches in diameter, about three feet long. So in addition to doing strand type experiments, you, it's also very universal for doing different types of combustion experiments. Uh, the vessel, the chamber itself weighs in the stand weigh about 7,000 pounds. The thickness of the walls of the chamber are eight inches. Uh, and right now we're, we've, we've just started work on it uh, and we're looking at testing out different windows types. And we've been working with Lexan or uh, as the first initial type because it's cheap. And we've so far tested it up to 30,000 PSI. And at 30,000 PSI, the polycarbonate or the Lexan window starts to extrude uh, right out, si right out the, the, the portholes. And, and you, you, can, you, you end up, you know, the initial window size is like four inches in diameter. It, 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 or the, sar the, 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 yeah, the, not the window size, but the actual uh, Lexan's four inches in diameter. The window size that we have is like an inch and a quarter. And what you do is you start extruding it out and you end up making and converting the, the four inch into like an inch and a quarter. It, it extruded about a, a quarter of an inch almost at that pressure. So now we're looking at reinforcing the back of the Lexan with sapphire, uh, which has got a, a stronger uh, capability. And eventually to go to the 50,000 PSI that we want to, will eventually go to entire sapphire windows through the system. But to my knowledge, in the, you know, in the, in the U.S., now you're getting up pretty close to gun barrel uh, propellants. You're, you're into the, you know, 0.3 gigapascal pressure. So, if, you know, if you, if you just calculate what the density is there on an ideal gas density, the gas density is higher than that of a solid. Okay, so there's other ways to, to do burning rate measurements as well. In the end, what I'm going to tell you is, the, you know, if I'm trying to do these measurements to put in a rocket motor, the, the strand burner measurements are just qualitatively going to be representative of what happens in a real rocket motor, okay, because other events happen, okay. The grain geometry is different than that simple strand. I could have a ROSA burning. I could have radiation feedback. 
and a whole bunch of things affect the burning rate. So really, you know, the simple tests that I just showed you are to, you know, qualitatively look at formulations, use that data to get fundamentals for maybe modeling the system so that one can fundamentally understand how the material is burning. People have used, for example, subscale motor tests. Uh, this is a, a simple case where I have this center perforated grain. The, the length of the, the motor here is maybe about four inches, a little over two inches in diameter. And I adjust then the pressure inside the, the, the system by changing the size of the, the nozzle diameter here. Okay, so if I want to study a, a, the burning rate as, at a particular pressure, I make it smaller for a higher pressure, larger for a lower pressure. And I define then what's referred to as the web thickness. The web thickness is going to be in this center perforated case. It's going to be the distance from the inner surface of the, the grain to the outer surface here. And I'm going to be interested in knowing how long it takes to burn from here to here. If this was an end grain, it would burn on this surface backward. Then I, the web thickness would be from here to here. And it comes apart relatively easy. Uh, and it's been used uh, more often in the, 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 in the laboratories than in the universities. Uh, Air Force laboratories and things like that to get measurements of, of burning rates. If you use something like this, this is the type of pressure or thrust profile you'll see. I need an igniter at the upstream side here that's going to basically shoot out hot gas and particles that are going to ignite the grain. I'm going to want to make sure that the flame spread across this surface here is faster than the regression rate so that I have a 1D system propagating radially outward. So sometimes I'll put a, a material on the surface that enhances the, the spread of the of the, the burning rate on the surface. And what you'll see then is a pressure profile that looks somewhat like this. Initially, the igniter will fire. That'll generate a flame spreading process. The grain will ignite. I start to pressurize. I start to fill the chamber. The, I choke the system. And eventually, if it burns as a neutral burning system, like an end burner, I'll get nearly a constant pressure profile until the grain burns out. And then I'll have depressurization in the chamber. And I use different types of techniques then to estimate you know, the, the burning rate from these sort of experiments. One's measuring the, the web thickness over the time, okay? So where I, I basically define the burning rate time period from, say, uh, position. Well, this is the, 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 the web thickness from the outer surface to the inner, to, sorry, from the inner surface to the outer surface. And this is the burning duration from at, when I assume that the propellant has ignited to when I assume it's burned out. And obviously, there's some uncertainty in that because of the igniter here and the depressurization process. So again, there's uncertainties in these measurements, probably on the order of 3 to 5 percent. Uh, there's other techniques in, to account for these uncertainties at the beginning of the burn and the, uh, at the end of the burn. Uh, you know, one puts a correction factor on the end to, to adjust when that burning process may have started and ended, but it's still looking at basically the, 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 the web thickness over the, the general burn time and, and adding a correction factor. And as I said, in, in all these cases, if I'm using a small motor, I've got to know something about the web thickness. It's a closed chamber, and so I assume that I, I'm burning from, it's a one-dimensional burn from the inner radius to the outer radius. That's not always the case because, you know, when I, when I make the grain, I'll have a mandrel and I, I cast it with a mandrel inside it. And that mandrel may have a sort of a rough surface and, it, and I may not have uniform burning along the surface. So as I said, you know, it's easily to have 3 percent uncertainty, probably larger than that in, the, in these measurements. You know, it, it, as I just mentioned, if I want to sort of correlate this to the full-scale motors, uh, there's many other factors that one has to take into account. Uh, you know, there's intrinsic parameters. That I've got to try to match the pressure, temperature. Uh, if if the, the grain has been cast, it's obviously got different stress uh, relationships throughout the, the grain itself. Uh, there could be, within the flow field, uh, I, I could have cross flow, erosive burning. The, the rheology of the grain is going to be different, how it's manufactured. Uh, the combustion stability, because it's a different scale motor, uh, radiation feedback, uh, and, and, and the effect of the flow from going through the, the center of the grain through the nozzle. Uh, so there's a, a number of factors that can affect uh, in a real motor. And as I mentioned, in a lab scale strand burner, the best usage of it is really to, to look at formulation changes. And because it's a simple one-dimensional burning case, to use that to build models to understand how the propellant's actually burning. And that, that's where it's been used most often. 
A couple quick comments about other experimental considerations. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the use of an inhibitor to, cre to create one-dimensional burn get, to get rid of the, 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 the flame propagation down the side. Uh, you want to make sure that the inhibitor uh, doesn't react or dissolve with the propellant and interfere with a burning process. Uh, most people use something like, as I said, paint or, or clear nail polish. Uh, the, the temperature dependence, as I showed you, because of the temperature sensitivity is very important to monitor. Uh, the burning rates are, are, are sensitive to the initial temperature. Uh, and so gathering data on you know, temperature sensitivity increases the, the matrix of data significantly because I showed you it's also a function of pressure. So what that means is that each pressure, I've got to change the, the conditioning of the grain to different temperatures to back out uh, temperature sensitivity. A significant amount of data if I really want to back out the in entire parameter space. Uh, pressure dependence, obviously uh, from St. Robert's Law, uh, uh, the burning rate's dependent on the pressure, there's some sort of power. Most propellants, it ranges between 0.2 to 0.7. If I'm trying to make an explosive, I want N to be one or greater. I want the, the acceleration to be reinforced by the increase in pressure. Here, you know, I want, you know, in case of a pressure disturbance within a motor, if I have a pressure oscillation and it's larger than one, then I'm going to have basically a, I could have an instability develop in the motor and a catastrophic failure. Typically in a motor, you, you're running pressures around 700 to 1500 PSI. Uh, experimental, you know, measurements under these conditions are, are, are very difficult. As the pressure goes up, you'll see when I talk about the, the structure of these flames tomorrow, there, it's a multi-zone flame structure. There's a primary flame, a secondary flame, and these flames all move very close within the surface, which is probably within a few you know, tens, hundred microns. And so the ability to get in and, and actually do diagnostics on that at pressure, just beca even because the pressure is high and what type of techniques are going to be used, is almost impossible. The surface is also, you know, not always, if it's a composite propellant, it's not always uniform. As I, as I said, the oxidizer particles are on the orders of 100 microns. So they're on the same thickness of the, the flame structure itself. So to be able to go in and, and use optical diagnostics is, is very difficult. Mentioned about erosive burning, the flow characteristics, monitoring, you know, what type of flow is developing in the system. You can actually see in, in hybrid motors, for example, where I just have a, a solid fuel and I'm sending an oxidizer down it and I'm building up a boundary layer like the Emmons problem. What you see is initially the, the flow's laminar in the boundary layer. You can see the transition occurring in turbulence, and what you actually see is the grain burns, the, the solid fuel grain burns non uniformly. After it goes turbulent, you see a much faster regression rate towards the tail end of the, the grain than at the, the front end of the grain. So you can actually see when the flow transitions by just looking at the, the surface of, the, of the, the fuel grain. Uh, the strain, uh, augmented burning, uh, what people have observed is, you know, if I, if I take a strand even and I, I, I subject it to elongation and let it relax, and I do this so it's like thermal cycling, uh, after you've done that, the burning rate has changed, okay? And, and people have suggested reasons why this occur. One of the most likely is that, the, the, you know, if I had small voids near the surface, between the oxidizer particles and the binder. The elongation is opening up those voids and I'm creating cracks in the system and it's changing partly the, the burning rate. This is very important in casting of a motor because again, if it's being cast at slightly different temperatures, what you can, people have actually observed as the, as the, the burning rate propagates through a, a motor, if it was under initially different stress at different locations, I'm gonna have different burning rates. And the idea of transient burning or, or quasi-steady burning very important as well. Uh, you know, most often when I look at St. Robert's Law, I'm assuming that the burning rate's a function of just the pressure and the initial temperature. But I can have phenomena that's referred to as transient burning. Uh, this goes back to, you know, you know, I mentioned that the time constants for heat transfer in the gas phase are going to be different than the time constant for heat transfer for conduction in the condensed phase. And so what that means is if I have sudden changes and the combustion characteristics above the surface. Suppose all of a sudden the pressure goes up. Okay, the burning rate wants to go up, the flame moves closer to the surface, and the regression rate is faster. 
What that means is that if it was burning steady, that I'd have a very thin uh, thermal profile in the condensed phase. I'd have less energy storage there. But at slower burning rates, it has a very thick energy profile, thermal profile, and there's a lot of energy storage there. So depending on how fast that can adjust to the different pressures, I have different energy contents in the condensed phase, which is going to affect the burning rate. And so being able to monitor that and control that is important as well. OK, so let me show you some examples uh, of actual data. So the, the JA2 here is a double base propellant. And here, here's a, uh, you know, uh, the burning rate as a function of pressure and changing the initial temperature of the propellant. So preconditioning the propellant before it burns. And, and you can do this by a number of different ways, just flowing uh, gas over the, surface, the edges of the propellant at different temperatures to lower it or heat it up. You can use uh, uh, thermoelectrics to change the temperature of the propellant and, and then conduct the experiment. But here there's a change of temperature of about 100 degrees. And you can see the burning rate here is changing by a little over an order of magnitude because of that change of 100 degrees. So that, and that, that's significant. And in this case, then, the burning rate being expressed in terms of p to the n, this reference a factor times the exponential of the temperature sensitivity, where the, the as I mentioned, if you went back and looked at the temperature sensitivity dependence on pressure, you typically find for most propellants it decreases with pressure. So it's correlated often in this sort of expression here. For this particular case here, if I were to calculate this temperature sensitivity, it has a value of about 0.03. And if you remember when I was showing you that ADN earlier, it was on the order of about 0.1 to 0.3. So it's extremely sensitive to temperature, whereas this uh, double base propellant, it's much less sensitive to temperature. Another factor that shows up in the burning rate is the, these pressure breaks. Okay, here I'm, I'm still looking at JA2, but I've extended the pressure range. Okay, and what you're seeing now is as I increase the pressure, I have a certain pressure exponent that has a value of about 1, 0.97. And as I go beyond a certain point, all of a sudden the pressure exponent changes. It's now gone up to a value Oh, sorry, it started at 0.63, and now it's gone up to a value of about 1. Okay, So uh, you know, the question is why? I mean, is that a, a chemical process happening in the gas phase, the condensed phase? Is it a physical process? These are the type of things people don't understand yet. What's causing these slope breaks and the, the pressure dependence and, and the, the burning characteristics? Because the simple theory just said it was p to the n. If I look at the burning rate of HMX or RDX as a function of pressure, here you see basically a, 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 you know, relationships that pretty much follow St. Robert's Law. I can get a P to the N value that's pretty accurate. When I compare a number of these monopropellants, this is a ammonia dinitromin, hydrodium uh, nitroformate. This is Cl20. This is RDX. This is ammonia perchlorate, HMX what you see is they all have different pressure exponents. So there's different chemistry occurring, uh, different physical processes that change the dependence on pressure. Over this limited pressure range right here, I'm showing you, you know, they're pretty much showing a, a constant value of N. But take a look at what happens with AP if I change the pressure. OK, so this is just a press pellet of AP or a, a single crystal that was grown large enough to burn it as a propellant. If I increase the pressure, the burning rate goes up, and then all of a sudden it falls off. It starts increasing again, and it, at higher pressures it goes at a, a greater slope. You know, if I were to develop a chemical kinetic model right now and do a numerical calculation, and people have done that from you know our current knowledge, what you would see is the only part of this curve that could be predicted is the blue curve down here. We still don't have a, a true fundamental knowledge of what's going on at these higher pressures. I mean, there's been you know, uh, hypotheses uh, that are occurring. Part of it could be that you know, there's impurities in the, mix, in, in the AP, uh, you know, that, that, you know, getting it from different manufacturers. Uh, but even the, 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 the pure grown crystals show this behavior. So there, if you look at uh, some work that was done out at China Lake, and you look at the surface of what's going on, you see this as a function of the, the pressure. So at very low pressures, if I quench the reaction and I look at the surface with a, you know, a microscope, uh, 
at, at these pressures here, I had a uniform steady flame propagating down. And if you look at the surface, you actually see this sort of uh, bubbling sort of feature where gas is entrapped in a liquid re resulting in a, in a froth. As you start going up in pressure, the, the flame still remains steady, uh, but the characteristics of the surface start to change. And eventually, when I see this negative dependency, I lose this sort of pore structure and I start creating needles on the surface. And so what definitely tells me that the condensed phase chemistry here is important in this system. As I go up and, and I'm changing the characteristics of what's coming off of the surface. And I'm also changing the morphology of the surface itself and, and how that's delivering gas phase products that are reacting above the surface. And eventually these needles cover the entire surface and I come back to a reaction rate that starts increasing with pressure again. Another simple example here. This is nitromethane, which is probably you know, the simplest monopropellant. It's like methane. People always study methane and hydrocarbon oxidation initially. Well, if I, you know, when, when people started to study monopropellants, the first compound they looked at was nitromethane, which is a liquid. And the, the, the relation, analytical relationships for the burning rate should equally hold as I, for a, as I did for a solid for this liquid here. But notice what happens again. At low, well, the, the low pressure burning limit here is about 20 atmospheres. And as I increase the pressure, I get a constant value of N. I get slightly above 10 megapascals. I get an increase in the, the slope. And now the slope is going from a value of about uh, 1 to 2. So I've doubled the exponent value. Okay, And now if I get the very high pressures, it drops off again. Again, if I do, you know, people, this is the, some of the simplest chemistry that people have studied. If I develop a, a deflagration model for predicting this, people can predict this lower branch here. But when it transitions up here, nobody's been able to predict it yet. And so, you know, you, you can start asking questions, you know, what's going on? Is this a physical process? Is this a chemical process occurring in the condensed phase or something occurring in the, in the gas phase? We pretty much know for nitromethane, I got to get up to gigapascals before I start to see a condensed phase reaction. So in this system, it's pretty much heat conduction in the condensed phase. So you know, I want to go back and just show you a, a simple, I mentioned this earlier. If I go back to what you learn in combustion and you plug in, you know, you look at the Millard Le Chatier, which is a simple analytical analysis of a deflagration of a premixed flame. What I find is the laminar flame speed is proportional to the thermal diffusivity times some reaction rate, all that to the square root power. If I pull up the simple Kubota analysis that I just did, this is basically the same analysis. If I take these two equations and I divide one by the other, I find that the, the burning rate of the, of the liquid propellant is equal to the laminar flame speed times this quantity here, here in brackets. Okay, and so what's showing up in brackets? Well, this is the heat release uh, at the surface, and obviously in the case of nitromethane, I said there's really, uh, only thing that's occurring at the surface is vaporization. There's no condensed phase reaction. So this is the latent heat of vaporization. Okay, and this is basically the energy content that occurs across the, the unburned to the surface. And so as I go up in pressure, you can start thinking about the system eventually going supercritical, right? And I'm going to eventually lose the interface. Okay, and at that point, when I lose the interface, the latent heat of vaporization goes to zero. So this term here basically goes to first would go to unity. As I keep going up in pressure, the propellant density, which is pretty much initially a constant, the gas phase density, these two are going to approach unity. I would expect the specific heats to go to unity. And this is something that these temperature ratios come out of the analytical analysis. But what it's basically saying is that as I increase the pressure, the vaporization temperature is going up at the surface. The ignition temperature in the gas phase slightly above it. And as they go up, they'll start merging. And both of these terms will go to unity as well. So if I go to very, very high pressures, what that tells me is if I, could, if I burn nitromethane, if I vaporize it and I put it in a tube, and I ignite it at one end, it's going to propagate down the tube at some velocity. It's going to have the same value if initially it was in, the, in a liquid phase. The two are going to merge. Okay, but when I think about what I told you earlier, the laminar flame speed is going to be proportional to p to the n minus 2 over 2. So it's initially going to decrease with pressure. 
So if I go back to this curve right here, the critical pressure for nitromethane is about 80 megapascals. So I'm coming up here, and I don't know, you know, it hasn't been modeled, but I don't know when the surface is going to reach its critical temperature. But this portion right here could obviously be related to the system going supercritical, and eventually I'm going up here into the high pressure limit. So if I were to plot on this curve here also the, the deflagration of a system where I had this tube and I vaporized the nitromethane and put it all in the gas phase, it would probably have a burning rate of about 40 centimeters per second, much like a hydrocarbon in the gas phase, right? So it's going to be sitting up in this region up here. And as I increase the, the, the pressure, its burning rate's got to decrease. And at some point, what it, the theory tells me is these two curves have to merge together when I lose that interface. Okay, it's a very interesting relationship, but again, as I said, people really don't understand these sort of characteristics. And, and, and they're very important in terms of designing motors because if I can change the, the, these slope breaks, if I can extend them, I can change the pressure I run my motor at. And if I change the pressure at which I run my motor at, I can actually get you know, much more thrust out of the system, much like in a gas turbine as well. There's, so there's a number of other anomalous type burning behaviors that occur. And just to show you some examples, there's what's referred to as plateau burning, where I can increase the pressure. It becomes pressure independent. Then as I go to higher pressure, it increases again. I can have mesa burning, where it goes up and decreases. I show you some examples of that. And I can even have what's referred to as intermittent extinction, where as I go up and all of a sudden the, 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 the flame goes out, and I, I have to reignite it when I get to a higher pressure. Th this is controlled in many, many different ways. So again, if, you know, most uh, propellant formulation people are empiricists. You know, they, they develop this through doing you know, em empirical uh, practice of you know, how to, can I control these things. These sort of features have not been really predicted in any sort of models. And so you know, changing, adding a catalyst, I can create basically plateau burning. If I change the particle distribution in the, in the propellant, if I got a composite propellant and I, it's based on AP as an oxidizer, if I change the particle size distribution, I change the size of the coarse size versus the fine size, I can also change this plateau characteristics. And what I was just saying is if I could actually, you know, in an AP composite propellant, if I could actually extend the pressure over which this is still burning in the plateau regime, I could run my motor at a higher pressure and I could get a lot more thrust out of it. But right now, I can't afford to let it go into this regime here because, you know, if I go up there, I can end up having a catastrophic failure. So here, here's just some example of some experimental data uh, that's showing the, the plateau burning for an AP uh, luminized uh, propellant. Uh, again, showing some characteristics that are very unique in, in burning. Uh, this is an, another liquid propellant. It's hydroxyl ammonium nitrate. I told you it was a solid crystal and oxidizer that's ionic. It's dissolvable in, in water as a solvent. Uh, what people have done is they've take that and they've also added dissolvable fuel like methanol. And so they have this oxidizer, hydroxyl ammonium nitrate. They have methanol and they have a little bit of water that acts as a solvent. And I end up, that's a tri-component system, but it's homogeneously mixed, so it looks like a monopropellant and they've been studying it as a replacement for hydrazine, okay, because hydrazine's toxic and, and been a lot of research trying to look at it. But look at its burning characteristics. This is without the fuel here. This is just the, the water and the hydroxyl ammonium contract as a function of pressure. And you can see, I, I, if I just change the water content a little, I, I change where the, the, the burning rate increases with pressure before it reaches a plateau. If I go to higher pressures and I add methanol, at low pressures, I've got a burning rate that has some sort of pressure exponent. The pressure exponent goes huge. I achieve a plateau. It starts decreasing, and then it starts going up again. Again, what, what's causing these sort of phenomena? Is it something happening in the gas phase, the condensed phase, at the interface? You know, we really don't know that yet. Here's uh, just some typical effects of what a catalyst could do. As a, a catalyst usually works best at lower pressures, where the gas phase kinetics are relatively slow because biomolecular reaction, so the reaction slow. So I use a catalyst to basically accelerate the, 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 cat, the chemistry at low pressures. So if this was a non-catalyst burning propellant, which had a pressure exponent of about 0.7, I'd see this profile here. If I add the catalyst, it's going to accelerate the reaction at low pressures. But as I get to higher pressures, the gas phase reaction is going to start accelerating. 
and I'm going and the catalyst will play less of a role and I'm going to start seeing this plateau and even potentially a, a mesa burning process. And I, sh I show some examples down here <coughs> of a double base propellant just at low pressure. This is the non-catalyzed and indeed if I start adding the, this <coughs> lead uh, stirrate type catalyst I can start seeing an enhancement at low pressure. If I come over here to a double base propellant with HMX added to it and, and, and again looking at lead stirrate you can see it affected the mostly at the lower pressure, I got the mesa burning, and then it increased again with the gas phase increasing. Uh, let me uh, say something real quickly about transient burning. Uh, it, it's uh, unique to solid propellants. Uh, you know, there's different types of transient processes, and I, I'm not going to go into detail, but obviously ignition's a transient process. Flame spreading down the, the perforation is a transient process. Extinction is a transient process, and if I have pressure oscillations that are occurring in the motor, that's a oscillation process. But there's something called dynamic or transient burning, and, and this is, goes back to the concept that I was telling you about uh, due to the different time constants of heat transfer between the gas phase, the condensed phase, and the chemistry that's happening at the surface. And, and so instead of going, I want to save a little bit of time here, instead of looking at uh, the details here. What's basically happening is if all of a sudden I, I have this burning propellant that's regressing from the right to left and I'm at a low pressure and all of a sudden some cause a high pressure in the gas phase. So I know because of St. Robert's Law if the pressure goes up in the gas phase I'm going to start burning faster in the, the gas phase. That flame's going to move closer to the surface. right? But, and, and that's going to respond quickly. But in the condensed phase, when I was at low pressure, I had this very thick thermal wave. Okay, and, it, and because of the, the low thermal diffusivity, low thermal conductivity, it's going to take time to basically get that energy out of the system to be that very thin wave. And as a consequence of that, during that transition process, I have a lot more energy in the condensed phase, and that energy is going to contribute then during that transition to a much higher burning rate than the two steady state limits. So to, to illustrate that, this is a pictorial example. Here's the thermal wave in the propellant at low pressures. And then all of a sudden, I increase the pressure. And ideally, at steady state, this would be the thermal wave thickness here. OK, so you can imagine if I'm looking at time here, this pressure excursion happens. At the ends, I have the two steady state pressures. But during, if I look at the burning process, this is the steady state pressure at this higher pressure. This is the steady state pressure here. But during the process of transitioning through the two, this thermal wave doesn't have enough time to release the energy in the condensed phase. So there's a higher energy content here. And that contributes to a higher burning rate during that transition. And so I, I can make use of this in different ways. Suppose I have the pressure all of a sudden dropped. Then I'm going to see just the opposite effect here. And so I'd have too little energy in the condensed phase. And I can actually have extinction. So one of, the, you know, one of the goals often in a solid propellant is how to extinguish it. So what's most often done is one has a depressurization system in the motor to lower the pressure quickly, and that extinguishes it. And what I, I'm showing here is that this process then depends on the, you know, looking at the characteristic times of what happens in the, in the gas phase, uh, what happens to the characteristic time in the condensed phase, and what happens to the characteristic reaction time for some sort of surface reaction at the surface. And you compare these three times then to basically the, 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 the disturbance time above the surface. If it's a pressure disturbance that's causing the change in burning rate, there's some sort of, say, frequency in which the, the pressure is oscillating. And what you find is if, if the characteristic time for the condensed phase to adjust its thermal profile, the gas phase characteristic time, and the surface reaction are all much lower than, obviously, the oscillation time of the pressure. You have a steady burning process. But once one of the times become of the same order as the pressure disturbance, then I start moving into a quasi-steady flame where I have dynamic burning. And if they're all of the same order, then I have a completely unsteady flame in the system. OK, uh, just a few more uh, terminology things. What you find is that most propellants don't burn at atmospheric pressure. I mean, if I take something like as simple as AP, a monopropellant, 
uh, it will not burn, or even the nitromethane, it will not burn at atmospheric pressure. And so uh, one defines a, a lower pressure deflagration limit, a PDL, below which it will not burn. Uh, that led to some of the concepts of the extinction that I just told you about. So if you look at AP crystals, this is about 20 bar. If I look at RDX, it's about 40 bar. If I look at a composite propellant, it really depends on the, the type of composition and the, you know, what I'm, the ingredients, the, the size of the particles. So I can change that low pressure limit to, to different values depending on how I, I adjust it. Uh, near the, the low pressure deflagration limit, the flame first starts to become unstable, oscillatory. You'll, it'll burn spotty and, and eventually it'll go out. A few more terms to recognize, uh, people refer to as smoky propellants, reduced smoke, minimum smoke propellants. A smoky propellant would be one where I add metals to the, the propellant grain. Uh, it's going to produce metal oxides. Those metal oxides are going to have an emissivity that's much very high, and so it's going to radiate and create basically a smoke cloud as it comes out the, the plume. And so again, these are characteristics, you know, if plume characteristics are important, become very important in terms of the design of the, a motor, for example. <clears throat> a reduced uh, smoke propellant would be something that looks like a, a double base propellant. Okay, so where I don't have a metal in it, but if I have a, a sudden expansion process, so for example, in a nozzle, and the, the pressure in the nozzle drops very low, then I can start to condense out water vapor, and I can condense within that uh, hydrogen chloride, and that creates droplets, and so it's referred to as a, a reduced smoke propellant. Uh, a minimum smoke propellant is, is basically one that uh, ha has, uh, based on a, a, a composite modified double propellant, uh, and doesn't really produce any condensed phases in the, even during an expansion process. So let, let me uh, end here with just a, a couple things to, you know, to give you some idea of where our understanding is. Uh, you know, I've, in this last lecture, I've, I've tried to emphasize, we, you know, we really don't understand, you know, from an empirical point of view, the, the value of N. Even from a more detailed point, you know, there's, I'll show you tomorrow, many people have, have looked at the detailed chemistry of many of these ingredients uh, people have built. Uh, simple one-dimensional models, and they don't predict the, the, the dependence of the burning rate on pressure. Uh, don't understand yet where the catalysts actually function most. Is it in the condensed phase? Is it in the gas phase? Is the catalyst, you know, depending on the type, if it's a metal oxide, is, uh, is it mainly reacting with the fuel? If it's a metal, is it mainly reacting with the oxidizer? Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, research that needs to be done there. Uh, looking at reaction channels triggered by combustion instability. Uh, this is an area that needs a lot of research. Uh, what are the contributing factors to uh, plateau burning? Uh, you know, I, I showed you, some, you know, there's a lot of interest in ionic compounds today because they have very low vapor pressures. And so there's a lot of the propellants like that, hydroxyl ammonium nitrate is an ionic compound. So how is that going to change with, you know, a function of pressure? When I go to supercritical pressures, What's it mean to have a, you know, an ionic compound versus a neutral compound? How does it behave differently? Uh, big question. Decomposition chemical kinetics in the condensed phase. You know, we've, over the, you know, when I first started doing research, it was back in, in combustion kinetics. I mentioned I came to, to Princeton here because I wanted to learn more about chemistry. People were still studying gas phase chemistry, looking at global reactions. You know, Fred Dreyer here has a flow reactor with Herb Glassman. They would monitor and measure species disappearance as a, as a function of distance in the flow reactor. And we would then take that disappearance and look at the intermediates and try to generate a one-step, two-step, three-step, four-step reaction. Only then was, you know, somebody like Charlie Westbrook, Lawrence Livermore, starting to look at some of the detailed chemistry and start making detailed mechanisms to try to predict that. Most of the rate constants in the 70s were still being determined by empirical methods, experiments. Today, you know, uh, ab initio quantum chemical calculations are basically to determine gas phase rate constants. We can actually generate reaction mechanisms. So the gas phase has progressed significantly in terms of our understanding. If we start looking at the condensed phase, I'd say our knowledge is about at the same stage of the 1970s, 1980s. 
there's very little understanding of how to approach it. And now you're starting to see some ab initio calculations based on solvent techniques, looking at what's starting to happen in the condensed phase. But how you do measurements in the condensed phase? Again, very difficult to get, you know, how the speciation is changing with time. It's a very complex system. Uh, it, related to that, you know, I showed you what happens as we go to high pressures. If the system's going super critical, you know, now you're starting to get real gas effects. You're getting caged effects. You know, if I have a molecule uh, that's trapped inside similar molecules around it, I'm going to, you know, statistically, I'm going to start changing the type of chemistry, the type of reaction. So I've got to account for that. So very high uh, pressure kinetics is, is still not well known. Uh, and, and surface phenomena, if I start adding metallic particles, how do the metallic particles interact and, and, and react with the material? How do they come off the surface? how they react above the surface, how they form the final products. The, the, you know, it's much like a soot formation process that people have studied in hydrocarbon oxidation chemistry. But if you start asking people, OK, I've got a metal particle like aluminum burning, and it forms vapor aluminum, that vapor aluminum eventually is oxidized back to a metal oxide. So it's like a nucleation process. It's very similar to uh, the soot process. Nobody's really studied it in detail yet. We, we don't understand that sort of process. So with that, I'll end for the day. Tomorrow, what I want to do, start off, is really start looking at some of the, the you know, understanding of the chemistry of these systems. Uh, then I'll move into metal combustion and start showing you some of the, the newer type thought processes, what's going on in the pyrotechnics field in terms of, you know, looking at self-assembly, looking at, you know, eventually uh, uh, additive manufacturing and, and microsystems and things like that. So. I'll end there for today, thanks.